Welcome to the Secrets of College Planning. I'm your host, Anthony Uva, and today we're going to get some insight in financial planning. My guest today is Kevin Ryan. He's a financial advisor for Insight Private Advisors, and welcome to the show. Thank you, Anthony. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, no problem. So, usually I start my guests uh, where they went to college, so where'd you go to school? Well, okay. Um, I wasn't uh, the, the best uh, student starting out, um, you know, uh, so I started at St. John's University in Queens. I was uh, commuting at first, for, you know, about 50 mile commute, which didn't work out so well. <laughs> then, uh, then I started, uh, then I found a place, I was in the attic of somebody's home in Queens. Um, and that wasn't what I thought about the, uh, the whole college experience was supposed to be. So <laughs> uh, a friend of mine had uh, come to the same conclusion. So he transferred from Manhattan College to uh, Ohio State. And he told me about it. I went out and visited him and uh, went out in the fall. And um, I'll tell you what, there is nothing like being on a Big Ten campus on game day. I bet. So that I was, I was hooked, line and sinker right then and there. So I transferred to Ohio State and uh, had a great experience. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time in the classroom, however. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I realized that uh, maybe this uh, wasn't uh, the right situation for me after about a year and a half. Um, so at that point, I, uh, I dropped out of school. I, I actually had a uh, really good uh, union job mm -hmm. at home uh, working for the uh, Long Island Railroad. So, uh, so that's what I did. I uh, went back to work. I um, got married, settled down, and then uh, realized that I really didn't like what I was doing, and unless I went uh, and got an education, my opportunities were going to be limited. Yeah. So at that point, I uh, listened to some uh, advertisements on the radio. There was a uh, college in, uh, on Long Island called uh, New York Institute of Technology. Sure. So I uh, contacted them. I went and met with them, and they accepted a lot of my credits. Um, not many from Ohio State, most from, from St. John's. Wow. And uh, so I, I started there. So the interesting, uh, I guess the, the thing about that, um, obviously maturity has a lot to do with it, but uh, instead of sitting in the back of the classroom, uh, I sat in the front of the classroom. Yeah. Instead of uh, just kind of blowing off assignments, uh, I actually did them and handed them in on time. Great. And what, you know, it really made quite a difference apparently. Yeah. So, so now, once you graduated from college, um, how did you get into financial planning and how did you become a wealth financial advisor? Yeah. Well, uh, again, uh, to quote the, the famous uh, line, a long strange trip, uh, I, I started, uh, as I mentioned, on, I was working on the railroad while I was going to college. I finished college then and decided I either wanted to go on to uh, law school or go and become a salesman. So I applied to a few law schools, I applied for a few jobs, and I decided that, you know what, the first thing that comes along is where I'm going. Uh, I wound up getting a job offer for a Swedish steel company hmm. located in Clark Summit, Pennsylvania, which is uh, outside of Scranton, and um, went and interviewed and um, decided to make the move. Great. So that's how I, I started there as an inside sales uh, salesman. Um, and within a couple of years, I was promoted to uh, outside sales and uh, started traveling in a territory from Maine to Virginia. Wow. So uh, I, it, uh, you know, I was with them for nine years and a great experience. Uh, I got to Sweden a couple of times, did a lot of interesting things, uh, very successful. And, but I decided uh, <clears throat> that uh, my opportunities were, were limited there, especially coming from New York and being a beach guy and everything, the, the mountains and, and the weather up in Clark Summit, Pennsylvania was not, uh, was not the best. <laughs> so I uh, thought I would like to go back, but I didn't really want to go all the way back to Long Island. So a uh, competitor offered me a, a position to start a uh, sales office and warehouse for them in, in New Jersey. And um, now I went to work for the Italians uh, instead of the, the Swedes, but, uh, but yeah, it was, uh, it was good. So that's what brought me uh, into the area and um, did that for about five years and um, looked at uh, owning my own business. Uh, I, I was brought in to run a, a company where the owner was very uh, ill 
Uh, I ran that for about six months and decided that that company was so underwater uh, in such bad shape financially that I, it re really wasn't going to be my best interest to yeah. put money and time and effort into turning that around. And, uh, but again, it was, uh, it was a great experience. From there, I uh, was offered a, a job with a company that was uh, based out of uh, Louisiana, out of Baton Rouge. Uh, again, being an outside sales uh, guy for them, and I did that uh, and uh, eventually decided to make more use of my entrepreneurial spirit and started my own company. Um, again, rep as a manufacturer's rep, uh, representative, which is, you know, you're an independent salesperson representing companies in, in the region. And uh, it, was a, it was a very good, good experience. But again, it's, uh, it's an eat what you kill. Sure. Uh, and, um, and there was no recurring revenue, which is really difficult. Every, every uh, January 1st, I had this vision of this big page turning. And uh, once it opened up, there was two big blank pages that I had to start filling <laughs> all over again. And, I, and, and so I was trying to figure out what are my, what's my skill set and how do I change that. So I was always interested in the financial services industry for sure. I was a kind of an amateur investor in uh, reading the literature and the books. And I uh, had a, a cousin of mine who was an executive with UBS and was for 20 years after me to get into that business. And what I realized that when I had an opportunity to sit down like this, you know, one on one with someone, um, it really I, I got the information of what they, you know, found out what they needed, how I can help them. It wasn't about what I was trying to sell them, mm -hmm. and that was always my approach. And the financial services industry had made a transition to an advisory type of approach, that kind of approach, sure. rather than, you know, back in the day it was smile and dial, you know. Uh, you know, stock of the day, bond of the day, pushing this, pushing that, and that didn't really fit my my style. But once they, you know, changed to this relationship advisory kind of a format, uh, it it was perfect for me. Mm -hmm. So, and they had the opportunity to be it wasn't transactional, meaning you know, st sell a stock, sell a bond, but it was more where I would put together a, an asset allocation. On, and, and be paid on a fee, uh -huh. so hence recurring revenue, right? And um, which really fit what I was trying to uh, to do. So eventually, you got into Inside Private Advisors. Well, I started with uh, with UBS in their training program, which was which was fantastic. I started in Center City, Philadelphia. Uh, went through their training program, and I, I was a gentleman that was was working for me. When I had the uh, the independent business, uh, um, was interested in buying the company from me, <clears throat> so I I arranged to sell him the company and make the move to uh, to UBS. The interesting thing with that is, um, you know, they they um, train you for three months and then you have to take the take the test to get your Series Seven. Sure. If you don't pass it, you're you're out. <laughs> So the, the you know I kind of like pushed all my chips to the middle of the table, took the test, and um, and that time from when I said submit till I got the result was it took about a year and a half, <laughs> or at least a year and a half of my life. But but I had a positive result and uh, right. went on from there. So. Good. So now you you do financial planning and it's all about. Um, students and parents and getting to college because um, a lot of people are looking to plan their their kids to go to college so what um, what's the process that that parents should be taking well it, it is such that that whole thing is uh, is such a challenge a college planning process um, really you know we all when we have children we we have an idea that we're going to be that they're going to be going to college and we're going to help them pursue their education, but uh, uh, you know in the meantime a lot of things kind of come along like 
you know, we have to get them into uh, in, into a, a school. They're going to take they're taking music lessons. They're playing on sports teams. They're you know going to um, you know dance recitals and and all these things come into play. And in the meantime, you know, like yeah, my, in my case, my oldest, my my daughter, she's uh, she's going to college and. Uh, but you know, she, we've got this uh, this dance recital. We've got this. We've got to add, uh, you know, fix the house up. We've got have to do this. So all these things come in to uh, to play to kind of derail that really that potentially the, derail the, the saving process. the savings yeah. process. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So so is that the first step for parents? Is is the savings process? It has to be something where they're putting something away each and every time. Yes, absolutely. It has to be a, a non-negotiable, uh, and and it's easy for me to say because I didn't do it. But uh, <laughs> now, uh, having gone through the process with two children, seeing the benefit of having that discipline, and um, so my, you know, as a financial advisor, one of the things that I've really focused on is the college uh, college planning and college saving. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm focusing even more on that. Uh, hopefully, I'm doing some writing along those those lines, and uh, want to uh, maybe come out with a book in the next year or so. But you know, with the concept of starting right from the beginning, um, I'm a big advocate of people opening uh, 529 plans. Mm -hmm. Um, and what is that for the parents that are that are out there? What what is a 529 plan? So a, a 529 plan is is a uh, an educational savings plan that uh, allows the uh, the parents to put money aside um, every year on a regular basis. Hopefully, the best way to do it is on a regular basis, so that you have, you know, what I encourage uh, clients to do is have. Um, we set up set up the account and have whatever if it's fifty dollars a month, a hundred dollars a month, two hundred dollars a month, whatever they think they can afford, um, and have that go directly from their checking account into their five twenty nine plan for each child. Now the the benefit is that those plans then grow um, tax free, and provided that uh, they are used then on the col at at the college to pay for. For college tuition, books, uh, whatever um, associated with college expenses like that, um, they will never have to pay taxes on on the earnings of those pro of that money. Now, uh, college isn't just tuition. I mean, there's other things that's involved in college, right? So, oh. so you have the the kids going out. Um, they're doing extracurricular activities. They're they're joining clubs and this kind of stuff. That's all money that parents have to think about as well. So uh, a college average college costs around thirty four, thirty six thousand dollars a year, right? Mm -hmm. As of right now, across the country, across the country, um, not so much should, in the Northeast. <laughs> what what should parents be thinking of as a price tag for college? What's a range that a college with all these extracurricular things that that they have to look at? Well, you know, the range as you mentioned in that thirties, it can, it can ra range from Maybe twenty thousand to like seventy thousand. Okay. Uh, and um, you know those expenses uh, really um, certainly the at the college level there's the the cost of tuition number one of course. Then there's cost of books. Have you seen what a book costs? <laughs> sure. It's like five hundred dollars a book. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so the, the cost of books is a big big expense. If they wanted, uh, and then now um, they didn't have this. Certainly, when I was in college, maybe I wouldn't have taken advantage of it. But a semester abroad is almost like a, a norm. So, you know, going to college, going to uh, going abroad is another certainly an additional expense. Sure. Um, and then depending on where your student goes, where you're, you know, you know, where like uh, if your student goes to Arizona. Um, now you've got to get them to school and back from school, not only to, at the start of the semester, the end of the semester, but maybe one, uh, maybe come home for a birthday or come home for a holiday or you know, um, whatever it might be. So if you are looking at four or five round trips, and maybe it's not only for you, uh, for for the student, but maybe you and your wife uh, <laughs> wind up going with them to take them. So 
these costs uh, all all add up, mm -hmm. uh, and so we we look at um, you know college uh, expense and you know all in college expense, meaning that if your student again is going to go to a place where you're going to have to include you know transportation costs, yeah. that that is another part of the expense. So now, there's a lot of parents that always say. Um, I make too much money. I can't get any financial aid or anything like that. What's too much money? What, what, is, what is too much money for parents where they're not, not getting anything at the college level? So I, I don't know that there's actually too much money. Uh, however, one of the, the, the first thing is the student themselves. And so, if they have a, a special talent, and, and all, you know, we all think about uh, the the special athlete, whether a basketball player, football player, baseball, whatever, where they may qualify for a scholarship. And I know you know a lot about about that arena. Um, but it also the other component is their academics, and and you know the the, the student has to have a reasonable uh, undergraduate academic. Uh, program uh, where they've challenged themselves, they've had good results. You know, the better the student um, uh, history is, their better grades, the, uh, their ACTs, SATs, the better opportunity they have to get money mm -hmm. because that schools are, are looking at those things. So, you know, the, you, you've all heard of the FAFSA, everybody, you know, that's the, the bane of many people's existence. Well, that is tied to um, federal government and, and how the federal government gives their student aid. Um, and uh, most, of, most of the time that comes uh, about through what are called Stafford loans, whether they're subsidized or unsubsidized. Uh, and basically, uh, if it's unsubsidized, that means you know ev everyone gets a Stafford loan. Uh, but if you don't have a high income, uh, and I don't know what that number is, but you can actually get it subsidized, which means that the federal government will subsidize that loan. And what that means is, in a normal unsubsidized Stafford loan, the interest rate that gets charged accrues from day one. From the day that you get the money, uh -huh. it starts accruing. Um, but a subsidized one pays that interest rate, so that doesn't continue to accrue. So that the whatever you get, I, mean, I think the total is something like uh, thirty-one thousand dollars at the end of the four years, because it's different amount each year, except for junior and senior, the the, the top numbers. Um, but you, you can imagine if it starts accruing from day one, yeah. you know that thirty-one thousand, it, it could be like thirty-four thousand. Know, I'm sure. just throwing out a number, but just the idea. And you're looking at four years as well. Well, that's that's the thirty-one thousand is over four years. Okay. Stafford loan is, is just like they're not a huge. It's not a huge loan, but it's still something to help. So now, what are some of the other types of monies that are at the at the colleges? I've I've heard things like merit money and things like that. What what are some of the other things that parents might might have an idea of what to look for? Uh, absolutely. Now, um, so merit a lot of times that that usually is what comes from the the, the schools themselves. Okay. So um, the again, I, I go back to having any sp sp special talent. You know, I mentioned sports, but maybe maybe the student is a great uh, actor or actress or a singer. You know, and has some credentials where they've actually performed, and they, and then they just like anything else, they would submit a tape. Um, or they're a great pianist or violinist or, uh, you know, uh, have a, any particular talent like that. Um, so now the schools themselves, and it mostly most of the private schools have what are called endowments. We've mm -hmm. all heard of that, you know, Yale and Harvard and, and Princeton, these huge uh, endowments. So there is another um, type of uh, program, that, uh, another form that has to be filled out, and that's called the CSS Profile. Now, the, the, so that goes along with the FAFSA. Everybody fills out the FAFSA. And then if you're applying to what we call a profile school, you have to fill that out. Now, that is what the, the individual schools utilize. The, that's the, the criteria that they'll utilize to determine how they're going to award their money that comes from the, from the endowments.
Okay, so so there's a lot of different ways of getting monies for, for a lot of these parents. Uh, is there an application process other than the CSS profile and the, the, the FAFSA forms? Is there anything else that the school needs where the parents can fill out, or is it just, you know, by whim that you got to figure out these things? Well, no, there's the ba obviously the basic application, uh, and then there are the two financial documents that the uh, financials, uh, area, you know, that the financial aid office will look at. Okay. Now, if th they will, uh, and, and some schools have supplements, I know UPenn for sure has a supplement, I just did one of those for, for um, a student. Um, and so they will ask more questions. So, you know, uh, there are different things that come into play, um, your, how your assets are. Like if, if you own your home free and clear and it's a, worth $500,000 and your student is going to go to a, um, a non-profile school, like, uh, you know, Rutgers or, or, you know, one of the state schools or something like that, the fast food does not ask how much your house is worth hmm. and how much you owe on it. However, the CSS profile will. Okay. And so they, they're going to ask a lot more in-depth uh, you know, financial questions. And they will also um, have some supplementary um, questions that they may send. And if they are unclear about what the situation is, they will um, send out uh, you know, and ask for additional questions, you know, some clarification on things. So now by parents coming to you, um what type of uh, financial planning do you suggest to, to parents when they get started with you? Yeah. Well, you know, and, and right now what I'm doing uh, is more later stage planning. I really uh, want to get started with uh, and start getting parents early. Had, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the heads of uh, counseling services at one of the local high schools had had told me when I talked to her about what I was doing, helping you know parents at a late stage, and by late stage I mean, like end of sophomore year, beginning of junior year, even through junior. Year. Um, she said you have to get to people early, and and you have to tell them. So I'm working on a, a program and a, and a process of how I'm going to accomplish that, uh, and I think it made a lot of sense, and it does make a lot of sense. So now parents can start out as early as uh, their kids being born to just start saving money. Absolutely. That's, when is, that's ideal. When is a good time for parents to really start saving some money? Is it teenage years? Is it before that? or is it? Is, is, you know, as soon as you can, as much as you can. There, there are restrictions in how much you can put in, and, and it's subject to the gift uh, tax. Um, so you're, you have an allowable amount. Uh, right now, I think it's 14000 per year per parent. So each parent could technically give their child twenty-eight thousand dollars without incurring any gift tax, uh, you know, consequences. Wow. Um, and um, but and and the other thing is if they uh, they come up with if for some reason they got an inheritance or a lump sum, you know, bonus or something, and they want to really fund it. Um, first of all, earlier the better for any kind of investment. But they are, and, and this uh, goes with, there are some different, uh, different 529 plans have different maximums, but some of them will allow you to do a one-time um, deposit of up to like uh, close to $300,000, you know. Oh. So, you know, 250000 in, in, you know, two twenty five whatever. And what that means is you put that, you can make that a one-time contribution, and then you cannot make another contribution for five years. But if you can make a contribution like that, <laughs> You're done. So now some of, the, some of these parents, um, you know, some of these students of these parents, they're going more than four years. Maybe some are going five years. Well, yes, that's, uh, that has become the, the theme uh, lately. And that what, uh, you're right, Anthony, that's what really adds to the, uh, and can add to the cost of college because, you know, students are looking at, the, they're on the five-year plan. Yeah. Now, and if you're even even if you're at a, a reasonable, and I say reasonably priced college at like forty thousand a year, so that's one sixty in four years. But now you're talking at two hundred thousand yeah. over five years, and and that that's a huge uh, huge deal. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So we're coming to the end of our show. Um, usually, what I ask my guests is, um, what advice do you want to give to the parents that are out there? 
that their sons and daughters, you know, they want to go to college and, you know, parents didn't save any money or anything like that. What's, what's your advice to those parents? Well, I mean, first of all, the, the uh, start early and, and make it, have the discipline to add it, add money on a regular basis. If you want to, uh, on their birthdays, at Christmas, whatever, instead of giving them $300 worth of things, take uh, half of that and put it into their, into their plan. Um, that, that's huge. So the time value of money is, is phenomenal. And that's what, that's what we're looking at for sure. Um, that's, that's the biggest thing. The other thing is study. You know, the best grades, the best you can do in school and, and be a, a somewhat of a well-rounded student, that's going to really sit well at the college level when they, at the admissions process. Great. Well, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. Anthony, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, no problem. So you've been watching The Secrets of College Planning. I'm your host, Anthony Uva. Until next time. 